Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 5. We're going to be beginning this morning in verse 17 to kind of tie the thoughts together. I know we covered 17 last week. Uh, but before we actually start, I got a couple things. One is, is that I actually said stenosis last week was curving of your spine, but it's actually narrowing of your spine. It's a narrowing of the um, passageway where the nerves are at, because I have stenosis. So I knew what it meant. And then, I, and then scolerosis is, uh, scolosis or whatever is the curvature. I just wanted to say that so that somebody doesn't say he said that wrong. So, um, chapter 5, John. Jesus in Jerusalem, if you'll remember with me, he went up to Jerusalem. They always go up to Jerusalem, uh, the city of the king. He's comes in the sheep gate, the gate that all the sheep would come in there's a porch there there's water there and uh, the people believed falsely that when the water moved the first person to get there and get in the water would be healed of their malady there's a man that we see there for 38 years 38 years he's been crippled in, and we see that condition that he's in because he says, when Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? He says, sir, I have no one to put me in the water when the water is stirred, but when I'm coming, someone else steps down in front of me. Um, and Jesus said to him, now listen, Jesus spoke the word. Just as God sent his word and healed the land, Jesus said, rise, take up your bed, and walk peripateo be evidence that i've healed you if you hear god's voice we're going to see today if you hear his word if he speaks into your life and you believe him you can rise up immediately and walk and then you become evidence well this really infuriated as he gets up and obeys which he had a choice you have a choice listen to me you have a choice today you want to hear the word of god and obey or do you want to keep doing what you've always done? You can pretend. You can be disobedient. I believe Jesus, but he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? You can continue to be disobedient, unbelief, not trusting. That's how all the children of Israel fell dead in the wilderness. They didn't believe. They continued to do their own work. Even though they've seen God's works, they've seen God provide for them with manna, water from a rock. They've seen God's provision of the bronze serpent so that they wouldn't die when the serpents were biting them. They've seen all the miracles that God was doing, and they still didn't trust God. They still didn't believe God. They got to Kadesh Barnea, where they were supposed to cross the Jordan. They got to a place where they were going in to the land of milk and honey. All the provision that he had provided for them. There was going to be gardens and houses and everything. And Kadesh Barnea means a place of decision. And they decided they couldn't trust God because there was giants in the land. And all of them, 20 years and older, died except for Caleb and Joshua. They stayed. The only two that was ready to go in was Caleb and Joshua. Do you want to believe God's word? Do you believe God's word? Are you going to rise and walk? This man believed it. He heard the word, and he stood up, and he walked off. He took up his bed. He's not going to sleep there anymore. That's not where he lives. Now he becomes a citizen of heaven. And they ask him, and people seen him, the Jews, the Jewish leaders is what this would be. Um, they said, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed on the Sabbath. Of course, the Sabbath being the uh, seventh day, the day that God rested. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. See, you know what they're saying now today? You go, you get up, you're walking, you know you're a citizen of heaven. God's given you boldness. He's given you gift. He's given you testimony. He's given you a place to rest your head. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And you go out and tell somebody, and they go, it's not lawful to talk like that. We want you to be silent. We don't want you to be telling us about your bed and, how, and why you're doing this on the Sabbath. See, 
They want you to shut up. They don't want you to tell them where your home is at, where your hope is at, where your heart is at. They don't want you to speak to them because it's death culture. He answered them because it required an answer. He who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Much like we've seen in the book of Acts, you decide whether I should listen to God or you. Well, who? Who healed you? I don't know. So what is it? You, do you know God today? Do you know your identity? Do you know your riches in Christ? Do you know your gifts? Do you know who Jesus is? And if you say, I don't know. Well, I believe he's God. Then it's your job to go find out. You should be investigating. You should be in the word, prayer, and fellowship. You should be studying. You should be finding out, building a love relationship, and drawing near to this God who longs to draw near to you. And then where's he going to do? Just like he does everybody. He comes and finds him in the temple. Where does he come and find you? Where does Jesus come? When you believe his word, the Holy Spirit comes into the temple, your heart we become the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And so he meets us there and he says, listen, go and sin no more unless the worst thing comes upon you. Now we know that original sin, garden, is why everybody's in their condition. There was no death. There was nothing that died, not an animal, not nothing. It, until, until Adam and Eve sinned, there was nothing that died. Everything had life, and that more abundantly, the garden was thriving and having fellowship with God. Then sin brings forth death. Whether this man's malady was because of sin, his own personal sin, we don't know, but the statement sounds like he might have been older than 38 and not born this way. So we don't know. Some sin is caused by our actions, our disobedience, or excuse me, some uh, uh, sicknesses are caused by our actions, our disobedience. But what Jesus says and what he would say to you and me, what he would say to all of us, look what he says, sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. Look at Luke 11 with me as we... Luke 11, verse 24. We talk all the time about washing and cleansing. We talk about positional and practical sanctification. And in Luke 11, Jesus speaks about um, this same topic, really. At 11.24, Jesus says, after he says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Listen. Listen, there's a unity there. There's a oneness there. There's a direction there that if you belong to Christ, then your whole focus should be gathering with him. If you're going to be with him. is gathering what? Souls. The ministry of reconciliation of souls. Our whole life calling is different now. Self is supposed to be in the grave. We're going to talk about this. But in 24, he says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man... He goes through dry places, seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept, put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Now remember, Jesus just said, sin no more, lest a worse stain come upon you. Now, that word worse is more aggravated or more physically, mentally, or morally aggravated. It can become worse than your first state. And that's what we're talking about here. When an unclean, an impure spirit, lewd, demonic, foul, it's talking about our, our, our life, our mental disposition, uh, our breath, the spirit is, it goes out of a man. When does it go out? When you believe in Jesus, when you hear his word, what happens then? Well, 
Jesus tells that he goes through dry places. See, it's got to find another body, another place to go. What's it seeking? Rest, a place to rest, another house to live in. It desires, it requires, and it wants rest, a place to rest, a new home. It looks, it finds none. It says, let me go back and check. Let me go back to where I was and my, my former. Let me turn back again. It means to go behind or go be, 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 uh, to turn back again, to turn under. And he comes and he finds it swept and put in order. It's interesting. Swept is just to brush off and sweep clean. But order is garnished in the King James. Garnished, like he garnished something. It means to put in order, to decorate and adorn. Listen, you can have your life real clean, adorned, garnished. You look like you're living the American dream. You've got all the T's crossed, the I's dotted. Everything looks good. But your house is not filled with Jesus. If your house does not have Jesus in it, I quoted it before we started, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. The reason we can be anxious for nothing, but in all things do prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus is because Jesus is the strong man and nobody can overthrow him. And if you put his will in your life, well, what's his will? It's his written statement of what he desires you to do, what he created you for. It's the will of God. It, it, it's what happens when, you, when you, uh, you write a will and when you die, it gets handed out. So if you die, you get to receive the will of God, the Spirit of God, when you die to yourself. And you can begin to follow God's will, which is, believe me, it's to be not just washed and cleansed positionally, but practically. It's a washing and cleansing as you get into the word, prayer, and fellowship. As you die to self and say, no, self, and put him in the grave, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live by faith, I live in faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you begin to do that, you fill up your house with the inheritance that comes from the will of God, by the Spirit of God, that's cleaning you up practically. But it, when that Spirit comes back, if he finds it swept and put in order, garnished, and there's no strong man there protecting you. Jesus is not there. Your desires haven't changed. You're not allowing him to change you. What happens? He goes in and takes with him seven other. That's a, that, that's a number of completion. Spirits more wicked than himself. Has to be worse than the prior state. And they enter and dwell there. They make their abode there. They live there. And then it says the last. Listen, listen, what last is? It's the final. It says the last, the final, the extreme is worse, more evil and aggravated physically, mentally, and morally than the first where you were at in the beginning. So go and sin no more. What does that mean? Go and have a heart to obey the will of God. Find out what the will of God is. Find out what he's doing. Not for salvation, but because you've heard the word and you've risen and you're walking. Because you've made your bed and you're resting in Christ. Because you've been given salvation, he tells you to go and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then what? Teach them to obey. Sin no more. Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. As he grew back in our text, John 5, 15, the man departed and told the Jews it was Jesus. So he met him. He met him in his heart. He met him in his temple. He met him in his place. He, he spoke to him. He told him who he was. Now he has some knowledge. And he goes back and boldly speaks to the ruling authorities and tells them, the witness, it was Jesus who made me whole. 
And then we're given the commentary from the scriptures that for this reason, verse 16, the Jews persecuted Jesus. They sought after him. What did they sought to do? To kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus, knowing that he has to answer them and give them an answer for what happened because of their hearts. And he I mean, doesn't even say that they said it to him. He said, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Listen, they had, they had taken, I think it's three scriptures, it might be four, in uh, Exodus 20, keep the Sabbath day holy, and then he gives up three scriptures, I think, of, but let's just read it. Let's just read it, it'll be easier. Uh, Exodus 20 and 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, set apart. And the Sabbath day is the seventh day, not the first day. Today is the first day. Sunday is the first day. You know there's a big move to make Monday the first day, right? A lot of calendars have Monday as the first day of the week. Um, it's a, a death culture thing. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. So for you people that only work five, you're supposed to be working six. And then you rest on the seventh. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He set it apart. Now listen. Because the Jews, the ruling authorities, the Jews, they got what's called the Mishnah. And they took that little section of scripture and they wrote 23 chapters in the Mishnah of what it meant to keep the Sabbath day holy. And one of them was you weren't allowed to carry your bed. You weren't allowed to carry a burden. There, there's so many things. You couldn't wear certain shoes if they had too many of the, of the big brads in them that, that made the shoes too heavy. You weren't allowed to wear those on the Sabbath day. It, it's just crazy stuff. They had to put the, on the, uh, the, before the Sabbath started. They had to load the fire with sticks so that so that they couldn't start a fire, so that they could start a fire. But then they weren't allowed to cook. I mean, there were so many things that they made up in the Mishnah, which put burdens upon people that had nothing to do with what God said. And that's our legalism that we have today. Things that God didn't say. Things that we create our own religion with, our own little standards instead of just believing. And then following the will of God. But anyway, Jesus did not break the Sabbath law. Everybody with me on this? That's the only point I'm trying to make. He broke their tradition. The way that they wanted to do things. The way that they had decided the word of God should be. And, and again, we have it today. If you break tradition of what they're teaching normally in the word of God, then, then you break that tradition. Wait a minute. Traditionally, we teach us like this. Well, I'm not following that tradition. I'm following the spirit of God. Because we need the truth of God, not a bunch of tradition of God that leaves you dead and spiritless. A form of godliness which denies the power thereof. Now see, the reason we know that Jesus uh, did not break the Sabbath law is because he's sinless. So we know that it had to be one of their traditions, something that they did. Jesus was sinless. We know that. Oh, why? Because of the resurrection. The Father would not accept his Sacrifice if he wasn't sinless. So he couldn't have broke their law. He just broke their tradition. Be very careful with that. A lot of churches, the reason we have so many denominations is because we break their tradition. It, it drives me crazy when they say my church teaches or my pastor teaches. What does the Bible say? What does the voice of God say? What does the word of God say? Not what did man twist it to say. Be aware that there's a lot going on out there. That's why there's such a book and conference ministry to try to tell you what the Word of God says. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus meeting with you in the temple, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ daily. Even 17, people will tell you that God rested and he doesn't work anymore. God is working right now as we sit here. God is working. My father is working. Look what he says in verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. See, the work changes. 
His work of creation ended after six days. Then he rested. But what did he begin? A work of redemption. Because he knew that he was going to have to redeem us. There's a work of redemption. When did it end? As Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished. That's when the work ended. Now we're standing with the spoils of the victory, being a witness, handing out that to others. The work is finished, though. The only thing left is, are you going to believe it, receive it, and walk in it, or are you going to reject it? See, the work is totally finished now, but as Jesus was speaking, they were still working. People are still being redeemed, but everything that needs to be done is finished. That's why he said to Telestai, it is finished on the cross. Now, really, it's been handed over to us. We're going to see in a minute that as the Father sent him, so he went. He was faithful to the Father. Now, as he sent, he sends us just like the Father sent him. And we are the ones that are standing in the victory. We are the ones handing out the spoils. We are the ones telling people the truth of the gospel. We are the ones that have to do the work and we're rewarded for the work. But God's work is finished on the cross. It was finished. When he said to tell us time, it is finished. So what work are you doing? Are you still doing the work of your own life? Are you still doing it in your own strength, in your own flesh? Are you following tradition? Are you following traditional church? Or are you being led by the Spirit? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. And then verse 18, and we will read, Therefore, because of all of this that we see, the Jews, ruling authorities, sought all the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous. But I do not seek my own will but the will of the father who sent me let's pray father thank you thank you for these words lord may they sink deep in our hearts may they grow fruit some 60 or some 30 some 60 some 100 fold may they change us forever lord and may they cause us to trust you and go and do your will that we would be witnesses throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Attica, Williamsport, Lafayette, to the end of the earth because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So my father has been working until now, and I have been working. 18, therefore, the Jews ruling authorities sought, let me find it, Sought. 
They endeavored, they plotted against his life. That's what it means, to plot against life. All the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now notice this, there's a few things going on. They were trying to kill him. They sought to kill him, verse 16. Then when he's made this statement, verse 17, it was profound. To them it was blasphemy. According to their tradition, he not only broke the Sabbath law, but he claimed to be God. You say, where? He made himself equal with God. The scripture clearly tells this. People will tell you, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, in the book of John, we're going to see a whole lot of times what he said to them clearly represented that he was saying he was God. Why would they seek to kill him? Why would they say these things? Look here what it says, making himself equal with God. When he claimed to be doing the work of God. Uh, oh, yeah, I wanted to tell you, make sure you hang on to... Um, Where's the word nothing at? Oh, it's in the next verse. We'll get to it. I thought I got ahead of myself. So their tradition, the way they looked at the Sabbath, the way they thought of the Sabbath, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. When Jesus, you got to get this right, when Jesus heals this man, it was because of the authority of the Father that sent him. Jesus is, is God on the earth. But everything that he does is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. Everything that you and I do as we go is by the power of the Holy Spirit. The attention is not supposed to be drawn to you and me. It's supposed to point back to Jesus. And Jesus is pointing to the Father because that's who we're worshiping. So the, the whole point of all of it is, is that it was God working. It was God working, not the man working. It was Jesus doing the work of the Father that was working. Now, we know that he's 100% God, he's 100% man. But it was the man that was standing there telling him to rise and walk with the authority from the Father. And that's who did the healing, the Father. We know Jesus healed because he's God in the flesh. But you have to see the point. It's who sent him. And that's what he's going to try to, to tell them is that it's about the Father who sent me. I have authority from the Father. And you and I have to get this because then he sends us in the same way with the authority from Jesus, with the same power. So when somebody's healing somebody or heals somebody, it's not the person, it's God. So really, it's not even the person working on the Sabbath. It's God working on the Sabbath, and that's what he sent him to do, was to heal the lame, the blind. That, that's what we're here for, is to heal those that have been damaged by sin. That's what the church is here for, sinners. And we're supposed to tell them, as they come to Jesus, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. That's why I'm always saying, get in the Word, build a love relationship, fill your house up with the will of God, fill your house up with the things of God. Make sure you have this relationship where Jesus is standing guard of your house. It's not a religion, it's not tradition, it's not just something that you're doing in the flesh. There's a living God who wants to come and be in your heart and do a home makeover and clean up the whole place and then set it up the way it's supposed to look from original design. He's garnishing it. He's taking care of it, not just sweeping it clean. He wants to give you everything in the inheritance that pertains to life and godliness. But if you just say a prayer and you reject everything else and you think you have personal salvation, maybe you are called. Maybe you did get called, but then you don't fill your house up. The Spirit can come back. And bring with it seven more, and the second state be worse than the first state. Worse. But he made himself equal. Look over at Philippians. Mm -hmm. Philippians chapter 2. They knew exactly what he was saying. They knew he was making himself equal with God because he was God. In the flesh, 100% man, 100% God. Now listen to what Paul says when he's writing to the church in Philippi. You know what? Uh, let's just start in verse 1. 
Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, notice these are the things that you would have. It's chapter 2 of Philippians. If any affection and mercy, Paul says to the church in Philippi, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. See, we're all supposed to have the same mind, the mind of Christ. No longer our mind, no longer what we desire, no longer what self wants, but the mind of Christ. Having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. See how we're all in unity? One, one, one. Let nothing, nothing, there's the word nothing, be done through selfish ambition, just for me, or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, there's the mindset, let each esteem others better than himself. Very hard thing to do, cannot do it without the Spirit. Then look at verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. That's a very important scripture there. Everything that you do should have the mindset of Christ, which means I'm looking out for others around me. So when I'm doing something wrong, I'm affecting others around me. When I'm not concerned about other souls and other spirits, I'm affecting them. I'm being selfish. It's only for me. But Jesus, who had everything, laid down all of it and became a suffering servant. Look what it says, verse 5. Let this mind, there it is again, let this mind, remember you're supposed to have your mind renewed? Let this mind means to exercise the mind, have this opinion, move in this certain direction of obedience. This is what this text is about, is obedience. You mean God had to learn obedience? Well, watch what the text says. Let this mind be in you. Set your attention on this, your affections on this, which was also in Christ Jesus. This was his mind, who being in the form of God, 100% God, 100% man, he did not consider it robbery to be equal, to have equality with God, but made himself, this is what Jesus did, it's what our example is, of no reputation. He emptied himself. He wasn't self-seeking. He laid down his prerogative to his deity, taking a form of a bondservant, a doulos, to one who voluntarily becomes a servant of someone else. It's a voluntary thing, not force, a doulos. It's what we're supposed to become. It's what all the disciples became. They voluntarily did the will of God and said no to self. And coming in the likeness of men, became flesh and dwelt among us, became our kinsman redeemer, and being found in the appearance as a man, this is what God did, he humbled himself. And what did he do when he humbled himself? He became obedient, even to the point of death, death on a cross. Listen, wait a minute, it's God. He is perfect. No, no. As a man, he became obedient perfectly to the Father's will. This was his mind. I'm going to do what the Father sent me to do perfectly. He became a bondservant. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now, remember, name means character, nature, will, authority. This is what it means. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, the abyss. Now, listen, I got, I'm just telling you, one day every knee is going to bow. You can bow it today. You can surrender today. You can become a bondservant today. You can walk in the privilege that he's given you today. But there's going to be every knee bow one day. And, and, and my opinion is, is that we're going to bow now because we believe. But then there's going to be those bowing, begging for a second chance, and then we'll be given. There's going to be those on their knees going, please, I didn't understand. I didn't know. And the Bible says, is appointed for men to die once, and then comes the judgment. It's too late. It has to be done while in the body. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory, to the honor of God the Father. Now, this is going to be in our text because we want to see this. This is why he gave this, is to honor the Father. One day, Jesus is going to take all of us and present us back to the Father. See, we lost our inheritance in Adam. 
But in Christ, by marriage, the kinman redeemer marries us back into the family of God. And now we can be back into the family of God. But there has to be some belief involved. There has to be some trust involved. There has to be some obedience going on, not for salvation, but because of salvation, it becomes the evidence. How you live afterwards becomes the evidence. Because you can't obey God. You can't live for God unless you have the Spirit of God. You can't obey God unless you have the Spirit of God. So this is your litmus test today, saints. Am I playing games? Or is the Spirit of God equipping me? And I'm not sinless, but I'm sinning less because I'm moving in the right direction of adorning and garnishing my house. It's not just swept clean, but it's being filled up with the will of God and the knowledge of God and the ways of God. And I'm doing the work of God for the glory of God because of the Holy Spirit that's in me. Because he came and visited me in my temple and I said, yes. Listen to me, because a lot of people, they think I said it and, I, and they might wrestle with their salvation. But the evidence can become clear. Are you living a life of resurrection? Newness of life where the old man is dead and you're not pursuing what you always pursued. You're going in another direction because you've changed your mind and you put the mind of Christ on. This is the mind that Christ had. And they are going to kill him for it because he made himself equal with God. He clearly is going to tell us here that he's God. Not just the son of God, but God in the flesh. They know this and they get their arms crossed here looking at him. And they're not going to stop until they crucify him and kill him. Verse 19 519 of John then Jesus answered and said to them notice who he's speaking to and he says most assuredly now in the King James it says verily verily yeah verily verily it's actually amen and amen and they say that that's the most universal word there is amen a a m a n is in the Hebrew it's a m e n in the Greek we see it here in the English amen and amen but it's, a, it's the most universal word in the world where it means the same thing in every language. And it's to get their attention. He's going to say it like three times here. They know that he's saying trustworthy and true. Listen to this. And, and he's speaking to them with authority as God. That's why they're wanting to kill him because they know that he's made himself equal with God. He's, doing the, he's saying I'm doing the work of God. And God can work anytime he wants on Sunday, especially the work of redemption and healing. So he says, amen and amen. Most assuredly, I say to you, listen, it's personal. He's saying to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does the son also does in like manner likewise listen to me listen nothing do you understand what the son is saying here he can do nothing without the father he sees the father he understands the father's plan he's following the father's plan the spirit of god is upon him without measure leading him in this body 100 percent man to do the will of the father his plan because he's become like us so that we can become like him so he's given us a pattern to follow and he says clearly nothing it's an absolute not a thing there's where's that out of here uh, nothing is an absolute um not even one it's nothing and, and listen to this because jesus is going to say this later about you and me john 15 5 when he says i am the vine and you are the branches if if a man abide in me and I in him, he can bear much fruit. But apart from me, he can do nothing. See, it's the same thing. The father sent him. And apart from the father, he can do nothing. Because he's following the father's plan perfectly. In a body that's physical, fleshly, confined in time, was in a, in a virgin's womb. 100% man, 100% God. And he says, it's trustworthy and true that I'm telling you 
that the Son, who is the Messiah, can do nothing of self, himself. Nothing of self-life. Because the flesh, there's nothing good that dwells in the flesh. The only thing he can do is what the Spirit leads him to do, what he sees the Father doing. See, the Father's always at work around us. He's at work right now. Do you know he's working right now? In redemption, though. The, totally finished on the cross, but he's redeeming through you and I, through the church, through those who would give witness, through the living word of God. His work is finished. Rest. But then we can see it go out as the message goes out, as the word goes out. I know you're like, well, how does that happen? Well, because all things are possible with God. It's finished at the cross, but we have a comma where we're sitting here during the church age, and all we're doing is standing in that victory, waiting and seeing how many people are going to believe. You're going to see in a minute in the text, Jesus goes and preaches to the captives, and they have a chance to get up out of the grave. It's pretty amazing. It's the word, though, that is spoken. It's the word that was sent to heal the land. And when you use word, you have a definite article. The word is Jesus. The word is logos, which is a discourse, or it, it, it's the testimony that we would read. So what do you see Jesus doing on the pages of Scripture? What do you see Jesus doing around you? What do you see the work of God around you? Are you doing in like manner? Here's our example. Are you doing likewise? See, this is what we're supposed to be doing now if there's true salvation. Because then the Spirit of God comes into our temple, meets with us, and says, go and sin no more. And so then we start being led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is doing what the Father is doing, and that is reconciliation of souls. And so that's the direction that we move in. We don't do anything anymore of self because we're crucified in the grave with Christ. And we begin to move toward doing what God is doing. Reconciliation of souls. That's it. God is no longer fighting with sin. Christ died perfectly for all sin. God is reconciling souls. The devil is lying to us and saying, deal with sin. No, it's already been dealt with at the cross. Completely, once for all, resurrection proves that God received the sacrifice for the sins of the world. But who is your soul following? What will is your soul being led by? Where's your mind at? Are you still doing what self wants to do and sin and Satan? Or are you doing what God's will is likewise? See, he made himself of no reputation. He put on the mind of obedience that I'm going to follow the will of God to, for the glory of God, to honor him. And what happened? He was exalted. We want to all go to heaven and be exalted and get a crown, but we don't want to obey. We don't want to follow. We don't want to be led by the Spirit. We don't want to die to self. We want to keep doing what we want to do and still go to heaven, still be called children of God. And it's an impossibility. You know, there's, there's plenty of people that, that sing about it. I, I always think of the one that I've, uh, you know, because everybody's a pulpit. I don't know if you guys know that. Everything that's going on is a learning lesson and it's a pulpit. Somebody's preaching to your soul something. And if you're listening to rock music, your soul is being preached to from the devil. Like, and Van Halen used to sing, I want the best of both worlds. And what are their lyrics? You don't have to die and go to heaven, wait around to be born again. Just tune in to what this world has got to offer, and you will never be here again. And, and that's nothing but, but good old-fashioned Buddhism. And see, that's a reincarnation, which doesn't exist. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And it, but guess what? Best of both worlds, right? Isn't that what we want? We want heaven, but we want to keep chasing our sin down here and chasing our desires down here. And we want people to promote us down here. But Jesus become of no reputation. That was his mind. He was God. He had all the power of the world coursing through him. And he made himself the lowest servant we're going to see in John 13. And he took this, that position and washed the feet of everybody else. And that's what he's doing for you and me. If we will listen, if we will let him cleanse our temple, if we will let him clean us up, and the impure spirit goes out, and then he fills us full of all the inheritance because we've been married back into the family of God. So now we become joint heirs with Christ. Now we receive all the inheritance with Christ that Adam lost, the first husband of mankind. 
we've been married back in with our kinsman redeemer. So we want to find out what God is doing. We want to see what he's doing in redemption. Well, he's preaching. He's sharing the word of God that, that pierces the, the, the conscience of mankind. He's, he's out with truth. Being led by the spirit of God, telling people about truth. He's, he's, not, he's not fighting a political battle. He's not struggling for the power of the earth. He's not struggling over who's the head of anything. It's finished. It's over with. That's all a lie. There's no physical battle going on anymore for sin. There's just the battle whether you're going to utter and be a witness and walk in your gifting and be a part of the body that we've been called to be. That's the amazing thing. All of us are called into the same body, the body of Christ. And he's the head of all principality and powers. He's the head. He's the one that sends us. He's the one that sends us just like the Father sent him. Let's just look at it. Uh, John 20, 21, after Jesus resurrected, he said, so Jesus said to them again, peace. Listen, that's what he speaks to us. His word is peace. You can have peace. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to have fear. You can have peace with God. And you can have the peace of God if you let him garnish your heart, fill your heart with his truth. Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Then what happened, Greg? Then he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Born again. Then he told him to go wait. Actually, he says, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins are forgiven. But we're not going to go there. But that's what you and I have, is the power to go and preach forgiveness of sins to others. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Not all the other chaos that's going on in culturanity. We're just supposed to be witnesses of Christ that we can now have peace with God. We don't have to be at war with God and the inheritance can be restored as you're betrothed to God's son and married back into the kingdom of God. But if you believe that, positionally, you shall be saved. Practically, you need to fill your house with the things of God so that it don't end up bad. It don't end up worse. It's not just a prayer. It's a life. So he sends us in the same manner. Jesus is doing like manner what he sees the Father doing. Now you and I need to do like manner what we see Jesus doing. What did he do? He humbled himself. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. He became a suffering servant. He became the lowest servant. What was he doing? Proclaiming the kingdom of God. Even when they beat him, even when they crucified him, even after he resurrected, all he spoke about was the kingdom of God. He didn't get caught in the affairs of man. They come to him and said, Jesus, divide the inheritance with us. He said, I have nothing to do with your earthly inheritance. I'm not, I'm not ruler over you. Come and follow me in my kingdom and tell people about their souls being saved. That's what he's doing. He ain't dealing with this fleshly stuff. But you can get caught up in it. It's going to burn one day. All going to burn with fire. Why? Verse 20, John 5, 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works then these that you may marvel, thou mad zo, that you may wonder, that you'll go, wow. But, but notice this. He says, the, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things. Listen, God is revealing now. Even as we speak, he wants us to know all things. He's not hiding anything from us. He's going to later, I think it's John 14, say that, that uh, he tells us all things. I call you friends, not servants, because, because a, a, a friend tells you everything. He tells us everything we need to know. He's not hiding anything from us. But here's something that's interesting. I was like blown away by it. Uh, the word loves there. I mean, I just knew it looking it up. It was going to be agapeo. And it's not. It's philia. Where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. He's fond of. I mean, what? This should have been agapeo, shouldn't it? Because love, he is love. It was just really strange to me. Listen to me. I just, I just, I, I don't even understand it. I'm not trying to explain it to you. I'm just telling you. To be a friend, to be fond of, to have affection for. 
denotes personal attachment. That's what that word means. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. That's what this word is there instead of agapeo. Again, Christ is fond of us. If you want it, he'll show you all things. He doesn't show it to servants. He wants you to become his family, his bride, betrothed to him, so that others can marvel. 21. Of course, on 20, do you have eyes to see what the Father is doing? Or do your eyes still looking at everything that glitters? Where's your eyes at? See, you have to be looking for it. You have to draw near to God. There has to be a heart that wants to do the will of God. Remember Jesus said, Behold, it's written in the volume of the book, I have come to do thy will, O God. See, that was his desire. That was his mind to obey and follow the plan of God. And in salvation, we need to have a mind that wants to obey and follow the plan of God of salvation. It means delivery from the sin nature, delivery to safety, deliver back into his house. You can say, I have that, and then all of a sudden be following something else and not even following anything that God's saying on the way to his house. Remember Enoch, he walked with God, and God took him? See, there has to be a walk with God, a daily walk. Growing, learning, meeting him in the temple with him. Your heart is the temple. Letting him redesign and fill up and garnish your heart with the attributes of God, the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Verse 21 now. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Now listen to me, because there's a, the word for dead here can be literal or figuratively. It can be uh, the, the physically dead or the spiritually dead. And if, you, if you're not careful, you'll read this text and go, why does he keep repeating himself? But he's not repeating himself. Here he's talking about spiritually dead. Did God raise people in the Old Testament? Yes. Can God raise people at any time from physical death? Yes. But we're not going to get to that until we get down here when he starts talking about graves. Right now he's talking about spiritually dead. As it says in 5.14 of Ephesians. Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. See, this is talking about spiritually dead. And he's putting it in Christ. The Son now has the power just like the Father did because he's doing the will of the Father. He's been sent as an ambassador, a messenger to bring life because he is life. He is God, we know. But he says, as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And see, now listen, listen, I'm just telling you, the Jews, they know he's claiming to be God when he says these things. This is why they're going to get more exasperated and want to kill him. They can't refute anything he says. This is talking about those that are spiritually dead. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And now he's saying, I'm God. If you don't honor me, then you're not honoring the Father. I'm here representing my Father. And, and, you know, we don't get it the same way the Jews would, but we need to understand it, that we need to place a value upon the Son um, that the Father has given him. He's appointed him to be the Messiah, the Mashiach. The, 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 he's appointed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that honor needs to be bestowed upon him. He says, for the Father judges no one, but he has committed, he's given that, delivered it up, yielded it to the Son. And, and judges, it's judgeth, crino, it means to distinguish, to decide, it means to condemn, it means to punish, it means damnation to no one. And again, he says he's committed it to the Son. Now listen, not at this time. 
Because we already know Jesus said in John 3, 17, he did not come to condemn or judge the world, free know the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, this is not judgment. The first time he comes is for salvation to all who will believe the Father's sins in. The second time he comes as a conquering king. The second time is for judgment, not this time. So he's speaking of different times in this context here of what's going to happen. Even when we get down to the resurrection, he's speaking of different times. So you have to understand the entire conversation of what's going on. He's speaking, of, he's speaking again, just like he did with the Samaritans. He's speaking spiritual, and they're thinking physical. And if you read this text in the physical without the Spirit of God, it, it won't make much sense to you. But the honor is going to be uh, to the Father uh, who sent him in the same way he's sending us. So where does the honor go? When you go out and do the work of God, when you do the you will of God, when you share the gospel of God, and people come to salvation, the honor goes back to Jesus, not to us. We don't get anything. In fact, God's going to try to honor us and give us crowns when we cross the finish line, and we're going to take them off and lay them down and sing holy, holy, holy. We're not worthy to, to have any crowns. We didn't do anything except believe. We just had faith. But you honor the Father when you honor the, pro, the, the, the one he sent, the one he has provided, the Son. You know what's crazy is all the Old Testament saints were looking forward. They were waiting for the Messiah, and he shows up, and they said no. Oh, is that in the chapter? Yeah. It is in the chapter. 43. We'll get to that maybe next week, God willing. He says, I have come in my Father's name according to his character, nature, and will. And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. They're getting ready to receive him. They're getting ready to rebuild the temple. I don't know if you guys know it. They can rebuild the whole temple in Israel within 90 days. Everything is already made to fully, they can fully restore, listen, fully restore all temple sacrifice. Why would they do that, Greg? Because they have no temple. They don't believe as Jesus is the Messiah. What's today? Today is the 25th, isn't it? Today, they declare the red heifer ready to go. They got it on the 15th. They had to, to uh, uh, put it away for 10 days and look at it and inspect it. And today, they're going to announce whether the red heifer has nothing but red hairs. It can't have a black hair. It can't have a white hair. That's what they need. Really, they need to build a temple, and they needed a red heifer to, to burn it, take its ashes, and that's how all things are purified. Everything that comes into the temple is purified by a red heifer. They just had five of them arrive on the 15th, and they're going to inspect them for 10 days, and today they're supposed to announce that they're pure red heifers. And then within 90 days, they can have the temple built if somebody helps them make that deal. Oh, there's going to be a temple. We know there's going to be a temple. Because why? Because three and a half years into the tribulation, the Antichrist walks in and sits down and says, I'm God, worship me, and commits the abomination of desolation, which brings desolation. And then they don't worship. Everybody else does, and they flee to Petra. And then after those three and a half years of them being uh, sought after, we come back with Christ on horses and rescue them in the battle of Armageddon, in the Valley of Jezreel, where the blood will be up to the bridle of the horses, where they're going to, I believe they're going to be raised and trying to fight each other to, for one world dominance, and they're going to have to join together again because they see the clouds part and, and, and uh, Christ come on white horses. Again, we don't have to fight. All we have to do is stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Listen, it's very important to understand that they're getting ready to receive the Antichrist. We need a one world leader here on the planet. If you don't have Jesus as your Lord, everybody's thinking we've got to fix this stuff. And that's why they're trying to bring it all down to, to, to one leadership on different continents and bring it down to ten nations so that they have, one of them can take over three of them and they can actually have the Antichrist rule and reign here on the planet and save everybody. Did you guys know this stuff? Did you guys know that there's, they have actually got the train? We talked about that the other day, didn't we? They've got this train that can deliver up to 2 million people to the temple to bring their sacrifices. Huh? There's no temple. Why would you develop a train? There's no temple. They know what's going to happen. 
the church is asleep in most ways, and we need to awake from our sleep. A great awakening is what we need. Not revival. There's no revival coming until tribulation time. But we need to awake from our sleep, to rise from our dead, because we're living in deadness. We're living in dead man's tombs. We need to wake up as a church and know that we've been given a privilege. We've got power. We've got a message to go out and tell people. We don't have to shut up. If they kill us, death has been defeated. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Well, I don't want to lose my job. Oh. Well, will a man give in exchange for his own soul? I'm serious. These are things that are very serious. I'm not talking about being haphazard. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit of God. And if the Spirit of God is telling you to speak, you need to speak. But you can quench the Spirit so easily. My friend who's in the hospital that I talk to you about often, uh, he, one day he's doing good, next day he's doing bad, sometimes he's doing good, sometimes he's doing bad. He's got brain injury. You get hit with a truck doing about 65 and you're on a moped and get your brain moved three quarters of an inch, you're going to have some brain damage. But I, we, we talked to him. We said, just start reading the Bible. He's got like six or eight people. He's got more people in his Bible study than I have in mine on Friday nights. Six or eight people that sit down, and he's got a speech impediment now. And I'm saying, pray, pray, Brian, that God will help you to speak better, to clearly enunciate the Word of God. Because if you just read the Word of God to somebody, it gives them hope. And he's reading the Word of God to a bunch of people in a psych ward. And they're all listening. And yesterday he called me and he goes, what are you doing? I go, did you have Bible study? He goes, yeah, I didn't get much out of it today. I go, what? He goes, I go, what did you read? He goes, Acts chapter 12. I go, you didn't get that out of Acts chapter 12? Herod comes against the church. James is killed. Peter's arrested. An angel releases him out of jail in the middle of the night. You didn't get that out of 12? Then worms eat Herod's brain because he's taking the glory of God. You didn't get that out of 12? And he's like, well, no. He goes, but I got mad. Well, here's my whole point. He was supposed to get a visit. He didn't get his visit, so he got mad. He quenched the spirit. He didn't get nothing because he was mad. He was looking at self. He was thinking about self. So he was mad. And so the spirit of God was teaching him a lesson. That's why you can't read the word of God. You can't look at the kingdom of God. You can't think about Jesus and then yourself be more important. That's not the mind of Christ. When self is more important than souls, you're going to grieve the spirit. You're going to quench the spirit. You're going to insult the spirit. You're going to eventually begin to lie to the spirit. And your heart is going to become hard over the deceitfulness of that sin that's going on in your heart. Because you're more worried about your little bitty kingdom than God's kingdom where everybody can be set free in. You're worried about somebody putting you in the water instead of you helping other people to get to the living water. And that's always going to grieve the Spirit. I said, go read it again, Brian. He said, okay, I'll go read it again. I haven't talked to him since then. Are you grieving the Spirit in your life? Are you concerned about the souls of the people around you? Listen, this is perfect stuff, even for parenting. We're not trying to beat our kids into submission. We want to win the battle. There's a, there, there's a plan actively going on to steal your kid's soul. And God has already set and finished a perfect plan to save their soul, so you're supposed to train them. So when you spank them, you're not spanking them to hurt them. You, and when you, when you parent them, you're not parenting them to hurt them. You're, you're, you're training. Always think about training in righteousness. That's what God is doing. He'll spank us, but he's not trying to kill us. He's trying to get us to go out and do what he's called us to do, to train us in right living before God, which becomes a perfect witness just when you're doing the natural. You don't have to say nothing. You're just living for God, and it's a perfect witness. Listen, we don't even need to be up here expounding on this word. I can read it to you. And if your heart had the Holy Spirit, the Spirit would teach you and you would come alive and you would tell somebody that their soul can be saved in Jesus. And if that's not going on, you need to go back to the cross and talk to God. You need to come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. 
Because we are supposed to be concerned about the souls around us. Having the mind of Christ. Becoming servants. Looking to obey. And it's easier to preach about than it is to live. But if we surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, it's easier to live than it is to preach about. Figure that one out. Verse 24. Are we still in the Bible here in John chapter 5, verse 24? Amen, amen. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, my word, and believes, pistio, to commit to, to trust in, to entrust your spiritual well-being in who? In him who sent me. Wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to trust in Jesus. Didn't you just see the verse up there that says, if you honor the Son, you're honoring the Father? If you receive Jesus... You're receiving the Father because that's where you're married back into, the family of God. And a good father is the one who's got this plan, who sent his son. Who did Jesus ask? We're going to see it in 14. He asked the Father to send the Spirit because he's following God's plan. He's not trying to receive glory for himself. He's given the glory and the honor to the Father. So he asked the Father, in your plan, Father, I know that you want to send the Spirit so that they can be sealed and so that they can be led, they can be taught, they can be washed and cleansed, and they can be prepared as my bride. So I'm going to lay my life down here so that that happens, and then I get to receive that bride when she comes to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's his reward. See, if he's getting a reward because of your works and what you're doing, he ain't getting much. Because nothing good dwells in the flesh. It's filthy rags in our flesh. But if we do it in the spirit, oh, we better keep going. So he who hears, you got to hear faith comes by hearing somebody. How can they hear unless somebody preaches my word and believes, trust in it, commit to it. In him who sent me, the Father, has everlasting life. Now listen. Everybody is everlasting. Everybody's eternal. Some are eternally dead. Some are eternally alive. All of us are born eternally dead. Right? That's what he's talking about. He was given the power to speak the word and people come alive. People come and be able to believe and come to life. Wake up. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Light turns on. You have life. Everybody's everlasting. But notice he says when you believe, when you hear the word and believe, now you have everlasting life, not everlasting death. Born once, remember he talked to Nicodemus? Born once, you die twice. If you were born just in the physical birth of water, you're going to die a physical death and then a spiritual death. That's what we're talking about in this text so far. Spiritually dead, separated from God because of sin. Wages of sin is death, spiritual darkness, no light. But if you hear the word and believe and trust in this good news, you can have everlasting life. That's about quality. Everlasting quality is with God in the light for eternity. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Notice where they were at. They were in death, spiritual death, and they came to spiritual life. Why? Because they heard the word and believed. They trusted it. Have you heard the word and believed? Have you trusted it? It actually, I love this word. I mean, uh, where is it? Has. Has everlasting life. Has passed. Listen to me. The word is echo. E-C-H-O. It, it, it's the word for possession in the Bible. In the New Testament, anyway. Notice he says, has. It's now. It's present tense. It's this moment. But now the just shall live by faith. We're walking by faith. We can't see it yet, but we're believing the word 
that we have it. We're now citizens in heaven. We're pilgrims here. This is not our home. We're mere passer buyers. We're learning to fill up our house with the things of heaven. Have you come to life? If you have, you can do nothing apart from him. Have you come to life? What are you pursuing? Are you doing it in like manner as you see the Father and the Son doing? Are you doing it in like manner of what the Spirit is leading you to do? He says again, amen and amen. Most assuredly, I say to you, verse 25, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Who just, who just did? Who just heard the voice? The Samaritans, remember? The Samaritan woman heard the voice. She was dead, and now she lives. She was blind, and now she sees. Then she went back and told some people. She had utterance. She had boldness. She went back to the city, and they came, and then they go, we, we believed your witness, but now we heard his voice, and we believe because of him. They came alive. It's coming, and it now is. It was going on even as he was speaking, but it's coming in a more powerful way after the cross and the church goes out to all nations. Remember what it is in the book of Acts? I like to remind people of this because we've lost it in the church today. The book of Acts is not the book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. But we shortened it to make it really brief. But its original title was the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Don't lose that because you need the Holy Spirit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Just like the Son could do nothing apart from the Father's plan who filled him full of the Spirit beyond measure. Who is the one that sent him down here? What a father. Welcoming us into a family. The hour is coming and now is. The dead spiritually dead they hear a voice that says arise wake from the sleep arise from your dead and this it's a voice of the son of god that's a messianic term and those who hear will live are you living today maybe you haven't heard are you living today are you still doing what you always did are you living today do you have life today is the spirit of god wakened you and quickened you That's what that means. Quicken from the dead. Look at uh, uh, Ephesians 2. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2. While you're turning to chapter 2. Ooh. A couple of verses. There's things I never read. I wanted to read. Ah. Is that in the New Testament after Galatians or Philippians? Ephesians 2. Have I went over my three hours yet? Did you bring a sleeping bag? Um, 2, 1 through 5. Look at this. Uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you, this is who you are. When you see you are, that's your position in Christ. We are, that's the church. We had some weeds there. Now we got some you. And you he made alive. You were dead who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. That's the way you used to, Peripateo, but now you picked up your bed, you rose and you walked, and now you're evidence of a living God. You're evidence of life according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's what's going on in death culture. That's what's going on all around you. You should be able to see it more clearly now that you've come alive among whom also we all once conducted ourselves 
in the lust of our flesh. What was you? Are you a conductor? Was you once a conductor of a train? Was you once conducting yourself, driving around in sin and disobedience? following the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. There's that mind that we used to have, but now we have the mind of Christ. And now we have the mind of the Spirit. And now we're having one mind together. And we're by nature, we were born, that was our sin nature, children of wrath, because we were dead. But when we believed in God, he made us alive, just as the others. So listen, don't look down on them. We were once just like them. Pray for them. But God, this is so important, that's a big but, God stepped in. But God, who is rich in mercy, Titus 3, 5, and 6, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. Listen, right now your position is you're seated in heavenly places with Christ. But you know you're down here. So practically, you still have to walk but positionally, we're there. If you've been made alive, you have every resource of the will of God, the power of God, the privilege of God. Why? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There's some evidence. There's some fruit. There's some people looking at you and seeing who you are. And then he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Nothing you can do but believe it and receive it. But we are his workmanship, his poema. We're works in progress. We're God's poem created. Oh, recreated, born again, born from above. In Christ Jesus, for good works. Listen, nothing good dwells in the flesh. The only way you can do good works is by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God, as you do likewise as Christ did. And Christ was likewise doing what the Father did, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's how you should be living now, is in those good works, because you've been made alive because of the mercy of God. Oh, I say you, but it's us. I mean, don't ever think that I'm leaving me out. I'm just preaching the word. Most assuredly, verse 525 of John, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Do you know you've heard the voice of the Son of God if you're alive right now? If you're living, if you have the Spirit of God in you, you heard God's voice, you can keep hearing it. You want to articulate it. You want to learn it. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. They do likewise. They're involved in the reconciliation of souls. They're involved in the, in the proclamation and heralding of my kingdom, of freedom from death. Because death has been defeated. It has no sting anymore if we are alive. For as the Father, verse 26, has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself. See, he's claiming to be God, and they're like freaking out on him. Can you imagine if you're the ruling authorities and you teach everybody, and people are watching you right now have to take this speech from this, this guy that you are mad at, who just raised somebody? He's got an audience because he just raised somebody. People are looking because there's a guy standing with his bed, and he's preaching to the ruling authorities who actually do not know God because they're apostate. They've forgotten God. They've walked away from God. They've made up tradition. They've made up all of these types of things that look like religion. And they're walking around looking like they got nice clothes on and they're pretty. But inside they're ravenous wolves. And he's preaching to them. And you know what they did when it says all the more they wanted to kill him? They doubled down and said we're not going to change our hard hearts. They double down. When you hear the truth of God's word and you double down and you say, I'm okay because somebody else preached to me this other message and you double down when the spirit of God is speaking to you, it's not going to end well for you. 
You're hardening your heart. You're hardening your heart as the, the children of Israel did in the wilderness in, in the day of rebellion, and they would not hear the voice of God. The homework, Hebrews 3, 4. Read it. You have to cease from your work. Hebrews 3 and 4. Do not harden your heart, he would say. Do not harden your heart as in the days of rebellion. Do not harden your heart and mix what you hear with unbelief. Mix it with faith and get up and go do it and believe it. Walk it out. Get into the word of God. Say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Do not rest in the dead. Let death pass away. Isn't that reverse of what they say? They passed away. No, death passes away when you come to Christ and you come to life. You don't keep living like you're dead. When you have light, you don't keep walking around in darkness because of who he is, not because of who you are. It now is where the dead will hear the voice of God, the word of God, the salvation of God, the son of God, and they will come to life. Verse 27. And has given him authority, power, privilege to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Messianic term, once again, he's been given all of that. First time he comes is to, to save those that are condemned. But if they choose not to receive it, guess what? White throne judgment where their name is blotted out of the book of life. Think about this for a minute. If God willed that everyone come to salvation, everyone comes to repentance, everyone's name's in the book. And then as they decide they don't want to, he just said, okay, take them out of the invitation book. Just mark them off the invitation book. They don't want to be clothed. They don't want to be further clothed. They've chosen not to receive, and then he starts blotting them out. You know how sad that would make a father if he's given his son, his only begotten son in his blood, and he has to mark names out? And we get back to that stenosis, the narrow, narrow way that few find the straight way. And here he's marking them out. He's like, I wanted them to come. I love them. I died for them. I really wanted them to come to my wedding supper. I really wanted them to be in eternity. And he's marking them out. Notice the words mark. He's given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. 28. Listen, because they're marveling. They're thalmadzoing. They're like freaking out. They're going, what is he saying to us? This stuff is not what we've been reading. This is not what we teach. Where did he get these letters, he says later over in chapter 8? He didn't go to Hebrew high. Where is he getting this? How can he speak with such authority? Do not marvel at this, because he knows they're marveling. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves. Now we're going to start talking about physically dead. Listen. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. You guys with me? And see, this is going to happen a couple different times, too. Those who have done good, remember we just talked about it a minute ago, you can't do good without the Spirit of God. Nothing good dwells in the flesh. The only way to have done good, to practice good, to be about good, is to come alive is to hear the voice of God, to have the spirit of God, to stop with self and sin and Satan and begin to follow God and be led by his voice and do the work of God, likewise, of reconciliation of souls. And listen, you don't have to worry about your own ability. He's already given you everything that leads to life and godliness. Do not marvel. They're going to hear the voice of God, the phone. The phone, the phone is ringing. Wake up and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, to the resurrection of judgment. It's damnation. That's crino again. The other word is chrysis, which means a decision. There's, there's a couple different words for judgment and condemnation going on. Listen, and it's going to happen a couple different times. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13, 14. Now remember, Paul talking to the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica is freaking out. They're like, hey, you said he was coming. Our loved ones are dying. They're going to sleep. They're in the grave. And he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. But the dead in Christ will rise first, those who are in the graves. 
physically dead in Christ. So they're really alive. Their body's in the grave. Their spirit's with God. Their spirit has to get up out of the grave. And then in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, that, it, that corruption will put on an incorruptible body. It gets a new body, and its spirit meets together in the sky. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will meet the Lord in the air, and thus we'll always be with him. And we should encourage one another with these words. That's our pot so. That's the rapture of the church. That's when Christ takes the church home, pulls the graves up. And I believe that the graves rise first because they're eight foot, or six foot lower than us. So then we're actually going up at the same time because they get up out of the grave first. And as they come to the earth up, we all go together and we meet the Lord in the air. Because he ain't coming back yet. His second coming is later. It's not then. His second coming will be after the seven-year tribulation at the Valley of Jezreel, the Battle of Armageddon. That will be his second coming. Then there'll be a thousand-year millennial reign where we get rewards and we rule and reign with him. Maybe we should look at that. There's, there's, there's uh, two resurrections. Now this, again, the graves. Uh, listen, did you guys know that 500 saints got up and walked around when Christ rose? See, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. He has to get up first, right? So after he got up, then 500 saints got up. Were they the first ones to get up out of the grave before the rapture even? And as he said, it is now and then, so it's going to happen twice, potentially. I'm just saying it doesn't matter. You just need to know. You need to be doing good. And the only way to do good is by the Spirit of God as you allow him to garnish your house, adorn your house, build your spiritual house, so that when the enemy comes back, you're standing. And there's a strong man that's guarding your house, and he can't get in to destroy you. Because you're growing and going. Let's just look. Revelation chapter 20. Don't go to Revelation. That just scares me. Revelation chapter 20. I forget what my verses were. 20 verse 5. But the rest of the dead. Oh, where am I at? 20. 20 verse 4, and I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and the word of God, who had uh, not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. He's talking about those who are going to go to the white throne. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. See, that's the spiritual death. It has no power. You're born once, you die twice. You're born twice, you only die once. The second death has no power over you, which is a spiritual death for eternity everlasting. But they shall, who shall? Those that are taking part in the first resurrection that have been born twice, born once from their mother and once from above, that have received the spirit and life, they shall be priest, believer priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And then verse 7 actually tells us that Satan gets released again because there's going to be people born in that thousand years of flesh that will actually rebel against God again even though he's been right there on the throne ruling with an iron hand. Uh, verse 21, or excuse me, chapter 21 21 8 of Revelation. Is that what I said? 21 8? Ooh. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is the white throne judgment. This is where they're getting thrown in. I was supposed to read 20 verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. First, they're cast in. Then, the second resurrection of the dead. The dead, the, those who have done evil, is what he's talking about in John chapter 5. That's when they're raised and cast in, as the way I understand it, with the devil into um, the fire. That's those who have done evil. What's interesting is this. Look at this. I want you to see this because it's very interesting to me um, that the word done, good, done is make or do, to abide. 
If you abide, continue and remain. If you stand in what Christ has done, because you didn't do it. But listen, if you've done evil, the word is different. It's a different word. This means to perform repeatedly and habitually the same sin, the same works, without changing your mind, without coming to repentance, without believing in Christ. Two different words for done good and done evil. Of course, good is doing God's work of salvation, and evil is... Um, to use the arts or to be wicked. See, underneath the spell of sorcery. I didn't tell you, it's so funny that I'm looking at this and my brain just does this stuff, but in 519, um, Jesus tells him he can do nothing except what he sees the Father doing. But then my life verse is 1 John 519. I know you're of God, but the whole world lies underneath the sway of the wicked one, which is what happens if you're not listening and following what the father is doing through the son by the power of the spirit then you're just underneath the sway of the other father of lies the wicked one doing what the world is doing and that's why you have to be careful right now the whole world satan's house is divided and they're trying to convince us to enter into this physical battle to follow what they're doing instead of just stay the course and work with the, what christ is already doing the good works of salvation of souls the ministry of reconciliation, as if Christ was pleading through us, be reconciled to God. Because that's all that's going on on the planet that matters to God is the salvation of souls. That's why he gave his son. That's why he gave his blood. His salvation of souls. He's not worried about men and their plans and all of their jockeying for position and rulership and kingdoms because none of them are going to last except for God's kingdom. And nothing that you do will last except for that which is done for God. The good works. Because even your bad works will be burned up, we're told in the book of Corinthians, as you, as they check the motives in heaven with fire. So, do not marvel. There's going to be a resurrection. What's a resurrection? Of the good and the bad. Anastasis. A standing up again. A, re a recovery of spiritual truth is what resurrection means. Did I tell you that rise means to uh, uh, wake from your sleep? It's a recovery of your physical faculties. That's what happens. Your spiritual faculties, your moral faculties. When you rise and do what God told you to do, you have a recovery of your faculties. The way that they were supposed to be. Stood right side up again. Which resurrection will you rise in? Is your heart looking to obey God, be led by the Spirit of God, and do likewise? Or are you still living for self and habitually practicing some kind of sin and ignoring God, hardening your heart, and still doing your own works? Verse 30, and we'll close. I can, again, he, he's going to finish the same way he started with this in 19. Watch what he says. I can of myself, in myself, nothing good dwells in the flesh, do nothing. As I hear, I judge. I make the decision. And my judgment is righteous. It's just, King James. It's just. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, listen. We've been sent by Christ just as the Father sent him. Whose will are you looking to do? Are you still in your self-will? Doing your own self-works? Are you still living in the flesh? Or are you looking to do the will of God? And that is the redemption of God. That is the salvation. I can't say it enough. The ministry of reconciliation of souls. If you're not concerned about that, if you're not looking to move in that, if you're not actually having a desire and an understanding that people beside you are dying and going to hell and it doesn't bother you, then you really need to check yourself. Because that's what the Spirit of God wants to do in you if He's building you up in the most holy of faith. He wants to give you a desire to go out in your gifting, to go out in your privilege, to go out in the power of God, to tell other people so that they can come to salvation. That's what we're here for. Until He takes us home. So whose will are you seeking to do? Your own? Or the Father who sent Jesus? And now he sends us. And then he breathes on us and gives us the spirit. 
so that we can have all the riches of heaven to go with. But we still have to do it according to his will, according to his power, according to his plan. That's where he receives honor from us. And then he gives that honor back to the Father. And that's how we're being adorned and washed and cleansed and filled up as a holy house, a temple. Being fitted together where Christ is the head. It has to be according to his authority, his power, his will, his character and nature. It can't be our own plans like the church is doing. That's what the nation of Israel did. And it became apostate and missed the very God who came to die for them. And we can do the same thing. Building our own little kingdoms instead of dying to self daily, taking up our cross and following him. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. May we cease from our works and enter into your rest and allow your word to search us because it's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide the bone and the marrow and the soul and the spirit, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And one day, all of it will be exposed. All of our nakedness, just like with Adam and Eve, all of the nakedness was exposed. And then they had a choice. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Lord, thank you for such a great high priest. Thank you for such a savior. Thank you for such a plan of salvation. Lord, may we hear your word and go and do likewise what you're doing, reconciliation of souls. Give us a desire to be your servants and your ministers for your glory for such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you.